Welcome to another episode of The Golden Hour. I'm Sharif Yunus here with Dr. Kevin Majors. Kevin, good to have you back on. Hey, Sharif. It's great to have you back on. It's great to be back. Well, I think we have a, a topic today that I am super excited about. So it's something that I've been practicing the last couple of weeks trying to improve at. And it's something that you've been working on as well. And the topic is the breath. That's right. So we talk about it in the context of mindfulness, but this is an opportunity to kind of go deeper into it and understand all the implications that it has. Yeah, and I think that the breath is something that we take for granted and learning how to be more deliberate with it introduces mindfulness throughout the entire day. So at the very least, a little bit of more awareness of the breath pays off in making us more deliberate and engaged, but it also makes like a surprising impact on how well we can focus and work. Yeah, I, I was, I found the kind of list of benefits after researching the topic a little bit, pretty staggering. But just to back up, I mean, I was first uh, introduced to the topic of the breath in a kind of embarrassing incident that happened at work one day because I was uh, working as a programmer and I was just really focused and kind of coding some for some project and I was getting really into it. And then all of a sudden my coworker who sat next to me, he kind of turns around and he says, uh, Sharif, what's going, what are you doing? What's going on? And I said, what? And he said, you're like, you're breathing extremely loudly. Uh, like I was like panting or something. Uh, so, so I was kind of mortified because I figured that I had probably been doing that every day for the last 10 years and nobody had told me until then. So I was probably embarrassing myself the whole time, but, uh, but it, it kind of led me to think, okay, maybe, uh, maybe my breathing, uh, could be improved, but it wasn't until that was, that was years ago, but now, uh, we've been kind of researching the topic and, and trying to get to the root of, it root of the problem. Sense. Yeah. Panting, uh, and actually mouth breathing and hyper focus go together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so really interesting. We'll, we'll get into why that's the case. But when, uh, when we're going down a tunnel and in the, in kind of, um, and in some ways, uh, like the, uh, yeah, you have hyper focus, you're more likely to do mouth breathing and panting just like when you're exercising. And, and overall, I mean, the, the, Breathing is kind of one of the fundamental biological processes that we do, you know, eating and so forth, sleep, so mm -hmm. exercise. So, but the kind of benefits to breathing well are really staggering. Uh, I know, because no, we never get taught. No one ever mm -hmm. gets taught how to breathe. Yeah. You know, like what's, what's the right way to breathe? So that's, I think, what we need to dive into. Yeah. What is the right way to breathe? Is there like a science behind this? Uh, or so maybe that's Kevin, I don't know if you want to just, just take that question head on right now is what is the best way to breathe? Yeah. Surprisingly simple. The best way to breathe is to breathe through your nose, only through the nose, always through the nose, inhale and exhale. If people do that one thing, it makes a gigantic impact on the functioning of their brain and the chemistry of their blood. But it's it's a it's a very cool thing how it works. I was so in our mindfulness exercise on optimalwork.com, we uh, I don't know if it's still there, but at one point we uh, I know early on we had the instruction when you just as we're getting people to start, breathe through your nose, not through your mouth. And when I'm working with people clinically, I had always asked people um, to breathe through their nose, not the mouth. After hearing from a friend of mine uh, who is a neuroscientist about a study that had come out. I think the study was in Nature, but it was on the effect of nose breathing on electrical currents in the brain. And the idea is that as if you're breathing through your nose, as you inhale, your whole upper cortex and the, and the emotional and memory cortex, the amplitude of their electrical signals increases as you inhale, and then it all decreases as you exhale. And it increases. And so because it's tied to the breath, it ties the whole brain together. There's this very cool mechanism by which breathing in and out through the nose 
produces these, this change in the neural patterns of the brain. And that oscillating up and down amplitude is thought to then help with entrainment of different neural processes together so that your brain gets better integrated. Now, that's what your brain does when, it, when you're unitasking and at the height when you're in flow. It's fully integrated at that moment. So it seems like breathing well has a direct, uh, you know, and you're not going to like this, Sharif, but it's, do you know how it happens through the nose? How? Through the nose hairs. <laughs> yeah, not a fan. <laughs> not a fan. So it seems that this is one of the, the functions of nose hair, actually, is uh, that it, it's uh, the, as, as you, you're inhaling, that is transmitted to your, in, to your cortex. And, and that changes how the electricity in the brain works. But the moment you start breathing through your mouth, it just goes away. So it's just that it, it is. And then, so you don't get this, this rhythmic oscillation with the, timed with the breath in the brain when you breathe through the mouth. That's really fascinating. Yeah. So w when I was reading about some of the benefits, so uh, of course these benefits to the psychological benefits uh, and kind of neurological benefits jumped out. I was also kind of surprised that even mouth breathing even causes things like crooked teeth, bad breath. It's also it's also been connected to ADD or ADHD. Um, so just the kind of range of effects is, is pretty impressive to me of learning to breathe through your, uh, through your nose versus your mouth. Yeah, no, it's. And it has to do, there's, this is, it's a very deep topic and probably a little more f like getting into brain and blood chemistry, but uh, then we, you know, and then maybe it'd be helpful for most people to hear. But just to say that when you breathe through your nose, you get the best form of breath because the air gets purified and humidified. It goes through your sinuses and then that it allows you, and it goes straight down to the base of the lungs. Uh, when you breathe through the mouth, it get, it's not designed to take the air well. And so you don't get that straight shot to the base of the lungs. You get turbulence and you end up aerating the top of the lungs. So with the nose, it goes straight down. You end up, by, by getting used to nose breathing, actually getting the perfect blend in your blood of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So the, the other thing, you know, is that doing it with the, in the correct, that correct form um, allows you to kind of put your tongue at rest with the mouth shut. And there seems to be an effect over time in the way the muscles are in the face that you actually change the shape of the face based on whether you breathe through your mouth or through your nose. And breathing through the nose opens up all the airways in exactly the right way. So like, for instance, one of the signs of being a mouth breather is snoring so and, and sleep apnea, because that's what happens when the upper airways aren't really being used. And so you're using the lower ones, the upper airways start to sag. See, when you breathe through your nose, you're giving a workout to those upper airways and keeping them in shape. So, and that's what, that's what keeps them. So it seems that one of the, the easiest ways of, you know, handling this when you're sleeping is simply to tape the mouth, to get surgical tape or silicon tape. And if you do that, it's surprisingly not uncomfortable. You would think that it'd be very painful, but it's, it's, uh, it's surprisingly comfortable. Um, and that can, for a lot of people, really increase the quality of their sleep and it, perhaps even change the structure of their face. So there's this study that was done, James Nestor talks about this in his book, uh, Breath, uh, this rather cruel study that was done on monkeys in the 70s, 1970s, uh, where they sewed shut their nostrils, forcing them to be mouth breathers. And the structure of their face changed so that their faces became more narrow and long and tall. And they, um, they, the palate, it became more like a V-shaped in their inside the upper part of their mouth. Uh, and these are things that you see habitually and their teeth then get more crooked because the, everything is getting narrowed. Um, they did that. And then after something like, it was like 18 months or two years, they release, they, they open up their nose again. Now all animals except humans only breathe through their nose. So the chimps would just go back to breathing through their nose. 
And they're, within six months, their entire faces had restructured again to look like healthy and normal. And when you see pictures of people, it, it, like, it widens the face and it balances the features and it makes things symmetrical. So it actually is very interesting the long-lasting changes that happen with a subtle shift in, in how you breathe. But the breath is done 25,000 times a day. So changing how you do it has a gigantic impact on what forces are applying to your muscles and bone structure. Yeah, and it just makes a ton of sense to me. There's a kind of short phrase that your nose is for breathing and your mouth is for eating. And it just makes it that nature has kind of set it up that way where your nose just has all these things. You mentioned the nose errors and, and everything. that It filters the air coming in. And so it seems like it's just made that way. And then the sinuses produce nitric oxide. So nitric oxide is uh, one of these incredibly important chemicals that you need to get from your sinuses. It lowers your blood pressure. Uh, it dilates your the capillaries. It'll, it improves the oxygenation of the body. It's relaxing. Uh, so this is why there seems to be an association also between mouth breathing and anxiety. In fact, in this in this book, uh, breath, Nestor, you know, kind of says something that I have often said that anxiety disorders are all breathing disorders. That it seems like that's the hallmark of anxiety disorders is problems with the breath and over breathing. And that's what happens when you breathe through the mouth. You actually are, you get your body used to artificially low levels of carbon dioxide because you're over breathing. But that makes people then sensitive to carbon dioxide going to its healthier levels. And they get anxious then, um, should their carbon dioxide rise. Well, you need carbon dioxide also as a dilator for your blood vessels. So it turns out that when you get when you breathe through your nose, your body gets comfortable with a higher level of carbon dioxide. That paradoxically increases how much oxygen your brain gets. It has to do with the effect. This gets into the, the Bohr effect. And you're, you get better delivery of oxygen at higher levels of carbon dioxide than at low ones. So that means when, if you overbreathe, you're not actually getting more oxygen because you blow off carbon dioxide and then you're less able to transmit the oxygen in your blood. Anyway, right, people can research it. It's called the Bohr effect, but it's about how hemoglobin transmits uh, uh, the oxygen to the tissues. Suffice it to say, when you breathe through your nose, you get used to higher levels of carbon dioxide, which are also vasodilating. And you get more nitric oxide, which is relaxing and even has immune benefits. But the way to get the nitric oxide is you have to breathe through the nose. Now, if you don't habitually breathe through the nose, it'll tend to get stuffed up. So it, there can be a, a time if people have been chronic mouth breathers, then their nose produces more mucus because the air isn't moving through it. So it kind of, that's what it does when it's not being used. And then you get stuffed nose and it's a vicious cycle. You end up then always breathing through the mouth because the nose is always stuffed, but that can actually be reversed. So you can learn to practice breathing more through it and then the nose cleans itself up again. And then the sinuses release more and more nitric oxide. Uh, so it's, it's fascinating the, the physiology of, of the breath and how it affects attention. Actually, another really cool thing just as it occurred to me, there is a study that showed that when you're breathing through the nose, the activity of your right and left hemispheres gets naturally balanced and coordinated. But when you breathe through the mouth, the, basically your, the activity switches to favor the left hemisphere. So you become more left-brained when you're breathing through the mouth, which makes sense because breathing through the mouth is associated with threat mode by your body. That's what you do when you're like fighting or fleeing. So when you're fighting or fleeing, you're breathing through the mouth, the left brain then gets really highly turned on. Um, and, but that can be reversed just by closing the mouth, breathing through the nose. And within a short time, the activity of the two halves of the cortex then balances again. Now, I thought maybe we could, so applying this to exercise, that a, a lot of people are surprised when I tell them that I, so now I, anytime I meet someone, I ask them, do you breathe through your nose or your mouth? Uh, <laughs> yes. I just kind of want to get to know them better. 
Uh, but <laughs> now there's, and oftentimes, actually, I, I'm surprised because I've been a mouth breather my whole life, so I, I see it as a huge defect. But other many people, it seems <laughs> they're uh, they're nose breathers, and but but they are surprised still when I ask them, you know, do you know also breathe through your nose during exercise? And they say, well, no, I, I breathe through my mouth through, during exercise because I want to get more air in. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about is is that a fair you know thing that okay I breathe through my nose normally but then during exercise I breathe through my mouth or is it, that's no good that's what I understand and I think that the the best science we have now and we might not have like the final word on this uh, but breathing through the nose while exercising one it aerates the lower lungs and breathing through the mouth doesn't aerate the lower lungs. But that's where you have the biggest transfer of oxygen. Breathing through the nose while exercising brings nitric oxide to the lower lungs, which dilates the, all, the, all the blood vessels to allow better transfer of gas. So breathing through the nose increases carbon dioxide levels in the blood. Now, if you're not used to it, it does feel a little bit like suffocating. But it's, it's a wonderful training to get your body's chemo sensors used to a higher set point for carbon dioxide. That seems to be the key thing, getting your body used to higher levels of carbon dioxide. Because that then dilates all your blood vessels and your muscles and gives them better oxygenation. But also this bore effect means that you're much more able to deliver the oxygen in your blood to your muscles when you have more carbon dioxide in your blood. So the problem with the breathing through the mouth is that you end up f feeling like you're doing a lot of work to breathe, but you don't oxygenate as well. And that suffocating feeling is not an indicator of how much oxygen your body's getting. That's only telling you where is your current set point for handling carbon dioxide. So a very simple test people can do to see where is their carbon dioxide tolerance set right now is to simply breathe in and out a couple times through their nose and then plug the nose. And you plug the nose and just simply count or check how many seconds can you go until you get a definite desire to breathe. When you get a definite desire to breathe, then you breathe. If you do that, you are able to detect how healthy is your carbon dioxide sensitivity. So, and the normal, then the way it works, um, the normal cutoff is something like 25 seconds. So if you can go more than 25 seconds, you're, you're doing well. Less than 25 seconds means your body is used to over breathing, which means you're breathing through the mouth. The, my experience in my practice when I, when I have people dealing with anxiety do this is that they can go five seconds, eight seconds, something really, really minimal because anxiety is closely tied into this. Now, what's, what's a good healthy amount of time to be aiming for then? Probably around 40 seconds. So, and when people do it, in fact, practice breathing, like when they're doing mindfulness, do the mindfulness exercises deliberately breathing through the nose. Um, and they get more and more used to it. And then you can also stretch yourself while exercising. Just try breathing through the nose. Uh, and if you, if you can, while exercising, try to decrease the frequency of your breaths. So you gently get your body used to a little bit higher levels of carbon dioxide. It's just a retraining process. You can do this, uh, sim I mean, if you just start breathing through your nose while exercising, you're going to get your body used to higher carbon dioxide. And it's going to feel at times, you know, like you have to switch to the mouth, then that's fine. If it's, you know, it doesn't need to be extremely tough and painful. You're just trying to be gently nudging things the right direction. And so if you feel like you have to take some breaths through the mouth while exercising, well, fine, do that. And then gradually try shifting back to the nose, just as you can tolerate it. But it, you'll gradually get to the point then where you can keep exercising the whole time through the nose. Uh, when people breathe through the mouth while exercising, they're taking shallow breaths that aerate the upper part of their lungs, not the base. And, uh, and then they're dealing with lower levels of, because they're blowing off actually a lot of carbon dioxide. So they're not able to oxygenate as well. So they have to breathe more. 
but your body will naturally shift if you breathe through the nose while exercising. And, and with that, you can breathe maybe a third the amount as when breathing through the mouth. But that, that will happen gradually over time. You can also, while walking, you know, try seeing if you can go four steps on an inhale and then a couple steps of nothing and then four steps exhaling and then a couple steps of nothing and then gradually lengthen the pause and the exhale time just to be trying to, you know, keep the inhale to four steps as you walk, but then gradually lengthen. And it's a really good workout for starting to increase your tolerance for higher levels of CO2. And I remember I was, when I was transitioning to the breathing through my nose, I was having a ton of difficulty, even just walking upstairs would kind of push me over the edge and I would need to start breathing through my mouth. And you remarked that that was actually a great, I was, I was beginning to, I wanted to give up basically. I said, maybe I'm just genetically predisposed to mouth breathing or something like that. Uh, but you, you indicated to me that actually th that's a great sign. That means that when you do make the transition, it's going to be a world of difference. Uh, and I'm starting to feel the, the kind of positive effects now, which is great. Just easier time breathing, more energy, uh, Lot, and mental clarity things. too, mental right? Mental clarity, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It really does help. And so doing a little bit of intentional breathing, um, you know, through through the nose before you start work, you know, it, it balances the halves of your brain. It brings you into the present moment. It allows you to start like gearing up the intensity. But it's amazing what a big impact such a small difference can make. Great. Well, Kevin, that's all our time for this week. But do you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Uh, no, one, one thing I was excited to see the research in, though, just as a final thought, is what is the ideal length of the breath, the inhale and the exhale? On, I would, I'd always you know, found working with patients and what we have in optimal work is it's about you know, four seconds inhaling, pause for one or two seconds, and then four seconds exhaling pause for one or two. But the pause really isn't a pause, it's just a slowdown, right? So now, cool, the research shows that basically the perfect breath is two halves, 5.5 seconds in and 5.5 seconds out. And if you do that, you breathe five and a half times a minute. That seems to be the perfect breath, but that actually is what we had. The other cool thing is that ordinarily when people are praying, actually there was a study done of people praying the rosary that showed that they naturally are all breathing five and a half seconds in, five and a half seconds out. And this is true also in, uh, the, the, like they, I think they examined something like five different prayer traditions, you know, that w when you have group prayer, and it tends to be always the case that when people are doing that, it's five and a half seconds in, five and a half seconds out. So there is, a, you know, an ideal stabilizing way of breathing, if you want to get yourself more alert and awake, you increase the inhale, the amount of time, and decrease the exhale. If you want to make yourself a little more relaxed and calm or ready for sleep, you shorten the inhale and you increase the exhale. So cool things on how to use the breath. Yeah, this is great stuff. Really life-changing. Uh, great. Well, Kevin, thanks so much for joining us. And we will be, we'll be back next week. <laughs>